Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 14th of June. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, Police, Raids and War. Financial Elite Prepare for Economic Armageddon. So Craig, it's on for young and old. Now, mm. we've had to, we, it's been two weeks since we shot we, an episode of the CEC Report. Um, the last one was the interview with Philip Seuss about the state of the financial system. Yeah. And in that time, some very dramatic events have happened, not least the raids on journalists last week in Australia, which shocked everybody except us, and we'll go through that in a second. And of course today, the breaking news today is this massive escalation suddenly by the United States um, against Iran, which really puts the world in a lot of danger at the moment. Yes. Right? But um, what we have to do is give people an understanding of the context. And what we've always said is that when you have a economic crisis, and that's the big thing that this show talks about more than anything else, right? The, the, the Australia and the world are heading into an economic crisis. And it's not just a banking crash or whatever. It's the system coming down because the system for decades has been this looting system that, that can't last. And when you have that, what do the elite do that are in charge of the system? Well, you end up with a fascist dictatorship, probably, and we actually, we actually produced a new citizen newspaper with exactly that title on it in 2002, straight after the big raft of terror laws that were introduced by the Howard government, which we'll go through. Yep. But economic, uh, economic development or you know, fascist dictatorship was the title of our yep. paper. Because what, 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 what you have is pretext for them to hang on to power. Yeah. And the other one we warned about and have been fighting ever since is this agenda for re regime change wars, right? Because under those circumstances, the, they just demand all these, the, 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 the state demands all these powers mm. for themselves. Mm. And for a long time, Craig, people poo-pooed our warnings, right? <laughs> um, but now look what's happened last week. Yeah, well, and, our, and warnings genuinely very specific. our warnings were very specific back then, Robbie, in, in that newspaper in particular, was that, look, when you do not develop the economy, and you allow things to degenerate under these policies of economic yep. rationalism, selling everything off, shutting down manufacturing, employment goes through the roof, speculation. What happens is that people will rise up. Yep. Therefore, you've got to protect, the establishment has to protect itself, the banking system has to protect itself against the people. So what we've seen is a huge number of laws, 75 I believe, introduced to do exactly that, all on the pretext of terrorism, stopping terrorism, protecting us against terrorism and so forth where in a number of cases that's been denied by the people, some of the people in you know, positions of powers, so that's got nothing to do with terrorism. Well, and the very people that are getting the powers, i.e. the intelligence agencies, most of these powers have been handed over to them, secret police forces. We have documented, chapter and verse, over decades, their collusion in terrorism. Yes. Right? And, and, and so that's, that's a big part of the picture as well. But let's go through what's happened now. So last... Tuesday and, and Wednesday, on the 3rd and 4th of June, the Australian Federal Police raided News Limited journalist Annika Smethurst for a story she had done over a year earlier, and then the ABC for a story they had done two years earlier. And these stories both related to national security, right? Now, the Federal Police was very indignant at the public's attacks on them for these raids because they said something that was quite true. All we are doing is enforcing the law, yeah. right? It's the, these laws that were passed. And as you said, there's been 75 passed since 9-11. Um, the, the, on the, our latest alert service here, which people can call in and get a free copy of if you haven't got one already, we go through this in detail. And the front page picture is this headline from the New York Times. Australia may well be the world's most secretive democracy because we've ran through more laws, even in the United States and the United Kingdom, who in a sense we've taken their lead on, but we've ran through far more of these uh, laws. Professor George Williams is someone that, like us, when these laws, when the first of these laws were unveiled um, 17 years ago, was fighting them and opposing them at, at the time. And he, he said um, this week in the Australian newspaper that there's been 70, he's, he's monitored that there's been 75 uh, passed in, in, the, in the last few decades. He says, it comes as no surprise that the Australian Federal Police has begun to raid journalists. The events of last week are the culmination of nearly two decades of lawmaking by our national parliament. Our elected representatives have armed the police and intelligence agencies with formidable powers that can be used against the media. They have simply begun to use them, right? 
So what were we saying all along? Well, this week was also the anniversary, Craig, just to prove to our viewers really? that we don't just talk to this and sit yes, on our hands. When you're too. involved in the CEC, you're not here for information, you're here to do something about these things, right? So 17 years ago this week, um, Wednesday actually, the we had we paid for well, over 30 grand, 30 grand, right? To take out this advertisement in the Australian newspaper, headline, end them, don't amend them. And we were opposing the first five laws that the Howard government unveiled after 9-11, right? And we had this statement in there. This is this statement was signed by the 200 people whose names you see in the ad. And the top, the top signature in this ad was the Honourable Jim Cairns, de former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. This was just a few years before he died. So our statement read, an emergency call to all Australians, a point-by-point -point comparison of the Howard government's proposed new anti-terrorist legislation with the February 28, 1933 not aka emergency decree by which Hitler consolidated his dictatorship shows the two to be virtually identical. Therefore, the ripping up of civil liberties proposed by the Howard government is, in the most literal sense of the term, fascist and must be thrown out. No democratic society should even consider the draconian fascist measures which the Howard government is proposing. And funny part, if you remember, was um, we use the word fascist in the text, yeah, but we were not allowed to use the word fascist on the title. They, had, they made us take it out and put the word draconian in instead. Yeah because it was too extreme. Now this is News Limited. Yeah. And now it's a News Limited reporter that's been raided by the police under what's the, the, the laws that were started with these ones. Probably we took that further in 2004, the election, and took out another full page ad with our 100 candidates that we stood for that election. Yeah, you know, exactly the same title. You know, stop the draconian police state laws because 2004 became more evident as yep. these laws were being passed, we also published a new citizen in 2004 to defeat the Sinecki fight for National Bank. Now, the Sinecki is effectively the networks that are promoting these fascist laws. So we produced this as well. And I think if people want to call in, they can Well, get that's an extraordinary that. publication, that particular one, Craig, because it goes through how, in a similar era, the 1930s, in the context of a global economic crisis, Fascism rose up, backed by financial elites. That's what we documented. And we had the same thing here in Australia. We documented who they were. These pro-fascist paramilitary groups called the New Guard, the Old Guard, etc. Mm. John Howard's father, we pointed out, was a member of the New, had been a member of the New Guard and whatnot. Um, so that is really that's that's very valuable history to read in there. Um, but one of the points I want to make about that first raft of laws, because the, the 75 laws that George Williams has identified have been passed, started with these first five. And the most important of the first five was the first one, mm. which created a definite a crime of terrorism. Now, th there was a huge debate at the time because every terrorist act involves pre-existing crimes. Murder, arson, whatever, right? They're all crimes. So if someone commits a terrorist attack, they can be tried for murder, they can be tried for arson. Why did they need a whole new offence, right? What they needed was a definition. They wanted to, to enshrine in law a definition of terrorism. And the definition they came up with was alarming. So the same George Williams, who's a constitutional law expert from the University of New South Wales, he said, pointed out, the definition was so wide that it would have criminalised many forms of unlawful civil protest, unlawful perhaps only due to a trespass, trespass, in which people, property or electronic systems are harmed or damaged. The section could have extended to protest by farmers, Unionists, students, environmentalists, and online protesters engaged in hacktivism. Now, that's not a that wasn't an, a, a, an alarmist thing to say. Last year, just to point out, there was a there was an incident in the UK where protesters who went and tied themselves to the to the um, the wheels of a plane to stop it from taking off in one of the main airports there. That's what they did, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's a pain in the butt to the airport and all sorts of things, disruption. But it wasn't terrorism. No one was in danger, right? But they are, those that group of they are being charged under the UK's terrorist laws because that comes under the definition of terrorism the UK passed. We had something similar. Now, but because we mobilised against this, we unleashed all kinds of fury on the parliament. They'd never seen anything like it. And I was having almost daily calls with um, 
the, the Labor Party min, the shadow minister responsible for, for the, uh, the bill, um, his office, and at first they hated the fact that they were talking to the CEC, but then when they just got bombarded like they would, they couldn't believe how much feeling was out there. Then, then they changed their tune and they would actually collaborate with me to tell me what was going on. Labor, under that heat, Labor dug their heels in and actually would not give John Howard these carte blanche laws. Now, the, prime, the leader of Labor at the time was Simon Crean. And what he did was very, very important. Um, he, they either amended them, and so some of those, there were some, there were some important amendments put through, but not enough, right? There's still, mm. the laws are still there, or they blocked some others outright. And it was only until Crean was dumped did, they, did Labor cave, not until Crean was dumped did Labor cave and they actually waved them through. And unfortunately, ever since, Labor has never oppose these laws. They'll make certain, but they always wave them through because they're scared of being accused of being soft on national security, right? And they've sold our rights down the river for that reason. And now they're claiming they're shocked by what's happened. But these are the laws they helped to pass. The media's the same though. Yeah. The media didn't fight these laws. Now they're shocked that it's happened to them, right? They didn't care when, it, when Julian Assange, no, I mean, Julian Assange, the British um, minister has just signed off on extraditing Julian Assange to almost certain death in America, right? Our government's not helping him. Our media hasn't defended him. Now it's happened to them. Will they change their tune? That's, that's the question. Now, let's take a break because when we come back, we want to talk about one particular aspect of this that relates to the daily operation of the CEC and whether Craig Isherwood and I are terrorists. Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're discussing Police raids and war. Financial elite prepare for economic Armageddon. Now, Craig, I foreshadowed this before the break, but here's my opening question. Is it a terrorist offence to warn Australians about the financial system? Well, Robbie, it could be, but what's even it more alarming be. is that anyone that's supporting us, that is supporting you know, the fight against the, secu the financial system and the cover-ups and everything, does that make them supporters of terrorism? Well, these are the questions that have to be asked because bear in mind um, these laws, well, police state laws, are not to protect the public. No, never They're not. to protect the ruling elite from the public. And the ruling elite in Australia is a banker's dictatorship. If there's one thing we've, we've established in this show over the last, however, in this whole fight we've had against Bailin and for Glass Eagle, etc., and the way that the, they, they, the bankers have some people in there like Jane Hume to make sure they do their bidding, etc., we are in a banker's dictatorship, and it's a global banker's dictatorship. That's what that's what Bailin actually is. So that's the ruling elite, and they have these laws to protect themselves. So before the break, I referred to the fact that the most important of the first laws they passed was the definition of terrorism, and in the, from the very beginning, that definition caught our attention because I want to read that the, the, the bill is called the Security Legislation Amendment Terrorism Act 2002. That's what defined terrorism. And it had these sections. That terrorism, the definition of terrorism includes anything that, quote, in, in section E, seriously interferes with, seriously disrupts or destroys an electronic system including but not limited to three, a financial system. And then a bit further down, 100.2, constitutional basis for offences this part applies to a terrorist act constituted by an action or threat of action if K, the action disrupts or if carried out would disrupt I, banking other than state banking, yada, 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 uh, to insurance other than state insurance, etc. cetera. And that, that, that other is just based on the wording of the constitution. So what they did is they, they, they came up with a definition here that, as I said earlier, was so broad, right, that George Williams said, look, this could... This could apply to a nurse on a union picket line, is what he warned at the time. Right? Yeah. He dealt with one scenario. We were looking. Well, we are here. We are in the CEC, blowing the whistle that um, the financial system is under threat. Yet everybody, from the government to the Reserve Bank to APRA, under, th being, under threat from the fact that it's so full of speculation, exactly. it can collapse. Not under threat from any other source no, other right. than that which it can implode in on itself. But we are warning people that they're security is in danger, right? And of course, one of the things that um, we get accused of is scaremongering, right? And um, when you have a financial system where there's no confidence in the system and, and, and um, you know, what if something we said is blamed for a run on the banks? Last week or a couple of weeks ago, there was a run on a bank in the UK 
based on a rumour. Now, we're not putting out rumours there. We're not, our information is not specific. We're talking about bail-in, for example. We're talking about bail-in. Which is the process of taking people's deposits. We're talking about the fraud of the financial claim yep. scheme. All we're doing politically is shining an extremely strong light on, on these, these lies that have been propagated. And for an example of how the establishment views that, back in 2005, we put out an, 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 an issue of our paper with the headline, The Mother of All Bubbles, explaining to people the derivatives threat in the system. We got a letter, yeah. Craig Ishwood and I and another director of the CEC got a letter from ASIC asking us to explain ourselves and whether we are giving financial advice without a license. Yeah. I, we got the threat from ASIC for warning about the dangers, right, while the banks that are perpetrating the dangers as the Royal Commission shows this is to be let off. Before the global free. financial crisis. Before right? the global financial crisis. Yeah. Right? So these laws are so broad, you don't know what they can catch. And that's the point. The fact that we have to ask this question is a sense of the danger. Just like the media ignored the danger until they were raided last week, this is something that we have to highlight. That's right. right? So let's take a quick break and move on to the war danger. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Craig, as we said before, the, uh, from the beginning, the, the breaking news today is this two oil tankers have been attacked in the Persian Gulf and Mike Pompeo is out there saying it's the, it's the Iranians, it's the Iranians, it's the Iranians. So we've now got a very dangerous escalation that could lead to war. Now, we're not surprised in one respect. When Donald Trump was elected, go back and look at the episode of the CEC Report. It's on YouTube in November 2016 after he was elected. Craig and I on the show... We welcome many of the things he said, but we said at that point that the biggest problem that we have with Trump is his views on Iran, right? Because we knew they were part of this neocon apparatus that he otherwise was attacking, but for some reason they had him on, on um, Iran. The, the, people, the people he was associated with were running this neocon line on Iran. So we've fought this since 9-11. When the neocons tried to, they seized on 9-11 to unleash a regime change agenda. I want to go through a series of videos that sort of blow the whistle on all this. So the first one is, this is from General Wesley Clark, where he laid out what the agenda was as soon as 9-11 happened by these neocons. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to... Come in, you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq? Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said... No, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just... He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. So go through the countries again? Well, starting with Iraq, then Syria and Lebanon, then Libya, then Somalia and Sudan, and then back to Iran. So that's, that's the agenda. Wesley Clark blew the whistle on it. Now, one of the, just to show you how, what a bunch of lies these people are, right? Look at Benjamin Netanyahu, who's the, one of the biggest agitators for these attacks. Look at his, what he's said over the journey. There is no question whatsoever that Saddam is seeking and is working and is advancing towards the development of nuclear weapons. No question whatsoever. If you take out Saddam, Saddam's regime, I guarantee you that it will have enormous positive reverberations on the region. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see a regime change, at least I would, in Iran, just as I would like to see in Iraq. The question now is a practical question. What is the best place to proceed? It's not a question of whether Iraq's regime should be taken out, but when should it be taken out? It's not a question of whether you'd like to see a regime change in Iran, but how to achieve it. The application of power 
is the most important thing in winning the war on terrorism. The more victories you amass, the easier the next victory becomes. The first victory in Afghanistan makes the second victory in Iraq that much easier. The second victory in Iraq will make the third victory that much easier too. So he lied about Iraq, and he's been lying about Iran ever since, right? And as, you, as he said, we've just got to figure out how to do it. Well, that's backed up by this guy. This is Patrick Clawson from the Washington Institute for Near East Studies. He said this in 2012, that we need, a, we need an excuse. We're looking for a pretext. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall we had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. One can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? <laughs> we can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, it, it's, this, this is not a, a either-or proposition of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. So forget what he said about Lincoln, though. That's just them trying to use Lincoln to give themselves extra credibility. That's a pack of lies. But the rest is clear. They want a pretext. So let's just go through the timeline. A year ago, Trump pulled out of the Iran Treaty, as he threatened he would, that they've convinced him to do. On the 5th of May, John Bolton, the main neocon in his, in his administration, suddenly said "There's a we've got to destroy, deploy the US carrier group Abraham Lincoln to the Gulf because there's a number of troubling and escalatory indications and warnings of attack. But that was con contradicted on the 14th of May by the UK's top commander in the region, Major General Chris Gicker, who said this. There are a range of threats to um, American and coalition forces in Iraq and Syria. Um, we monitor them all. Uh, Iranian-backed forces is clearly one of them. Um, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but um, th there are a substantial number of uh, militia groups in Iraq and Syria, um, and we don't see any increased threat from um, many of them at this stage. There's been no uh, increased threat um, from uh, Iranian-backed forces in Iraq and Syria. Um, we're aware of their presence, clearly, um, uh, and we monitor them along with a whole range of others um, because that's the environment we're in. Now, the worrying thing, Craig, is two days later, his own government contradicted him and said, no, no, we regard Iran as a threat. And then on the 19th of May, the UK deployed the special boat service to the Persian Gulf to protect shipping, but this is the water version of the SAS, we said, uh-oh, here's a danger for a provocation. Is that what we've got? Instead of blaming Iran, look at the people who want a war. But we're out of time. Thanks very much for tuning in. Tune in next week for more.